every line on the London Underground is unique in some way, which is a bit of a pain for the people in charge. Each line has different requirements, so it's hard to standardise train designs between lines. They do, wherever they can, but nevertheless there is no one-size-fits-all train design. If you've ever ridden on the Metropolitan Line, you may have noticed that while the basic design of train is the same as those on the District, Circle and Hammersmith and City Lines, they are different. There's one extra coach. And also, some of the seating is transverse, or across if you prefer. The only other line on the underground with transverse seating is the Bakerloo, and that's only because the trains are absolutely ancient. But the Metropolitan trains are far newer than that, dating from 2010, long after the Underground had adopted a policy of longitudinal or sideways seating for most of its trains. So what's so special about the Metropolitan line? Well, there are two reasons. One is scientific, apparently, and the other relates to rich people in Buckinghamshire. So, the sort of sciencey one. For busy metro trains, sideways seating is preferable because it creates more standing room and you can fit more standing passengers than seated passengers in a carriage. The majority of passengers will be making a fairly short journey either from the suburbs to central London or within central London. So while sideways seating and standing are not super comfortable of course, at least you won't be there for long. Well, as long as there are no problems with the service of course. The general assumption that designers of trains work with is that if you're travelling a long distance you'd rather be facing forwards or you can tolerate sitting backwards. Now I've never seen any scientific data on this, but nevertheless that is the principle on which trains are designed. Trains that travel long distances will have exclusively forward or backward facing seats. Trains that typically carry passengers short distances over very busy lines will usually have sideways seats. Trains that are in between have a little mix of both. The Metropolitan Line falls into that in-between category. Yes, the line is partly in central London, but since the 1930s it's skipped past a lot of the inner suburban stations. So the distance between stations is greater than on other lines. And once you get further out, the stations are further apart anyway. But that's not the only reason. I mean, it's not like the Metropolitan Line is the only line that travels a long way out. Anyone taking the Central Line from Epping to Central London is going to be sat sideways for a long time, for instance. The other major reason relates not to the number of passengers, but the kind of passengers. You see, the Metropolitan Line began life as the Metropolitan Railway. Initially, it was just a simple commuter line, the original Metro service. But under Chairman Sir Edward Watkin, who took over in 1872, the character of the railway changed. It's one of the great ironies of railway history that the company that pioneered underground train services should be chaired by a man with no interest in underground services. Watkin saw the Metropolitan as a main line. He wanted it to ultimately run to Oxford and, given his controlling interest in other railway companies, it seems likely that there would have been through trains even further afield. While of course the Metropolitan never abandoned its trains for ordinary commuters, it also aimed itself firmly at long-distance travellers. The Metropolitan Railway encouraged people to move out to the countryside of Middlesex and Buckinghamshire and commute into London by express train. They even formed a company, Metropolitan Railway Country Estates Limited, to get houses built out there. They coined the term Metroland as a marketing device for these destinations. Most underground railways emphasised their egalitarian nature, the idea that anyone could ride their trains no matter their status. The Metropolitan, on the other hand, pushed much of their advertising towards the middle and upper class. People who dreamed of owning a house in the countryside. People who spent their weekends on the golf course. In 1910 they even introduced a Pullman service for their wealthiest passengers. One could enjoy breakfast on the train from Verney Junction to Liverpool Street in the morning and supper on the way back, complete with cocktails. 
In 1933, every underground line, apart from the Waterloo and City, was taken over by London Transport, or, to use its more formal title, the London Passenger Transport Board. London Transport had a philosophy that was the complete opposite of Watkins. They viewed themselves as providing a purely commuter service, and over the next three decades they undid a lot of the old company's work. The more outlying stations were abandoned. The larger locomotives were handed over to the London and North Eastern Railway. Pullman services were withdrawn in 1940. And the Metropolitan was brought more in line with the rest of the network, whether it liked it or not. But some things didn't change. The same old carriages were used on long-distance trains, featuring compartments rather than the open layout of other tube trains. They were still in use in the 1950s, 40 years old and distinctly antiquated. By then, though, change was coming. London Transport were planning to electrify the line from Rickmansworth to Amersham, and to scrap the service to Aylesbury altogether. Locomotive hauled stock would be replaced with electric multiple units, as were used on the rest of the network. The train supplied would be the A60 and A62 stock, a new custom-designed type. But while London Transport could change the service, they couldn't change the passengers. The wealthy and influential passengers rather enjoyed their privacy and seating space that compartments offered, and weren't going to give it up without a fight. Yet at the same time, carrying on with Victorian railway practice would mean carrying fewer third-class passengers. The riffraff may not have paid as much to travel, but there were considerably more of them. So a compromise was reached. They would get new trains. They had no compartments and no first-class seats, but they would feature transverse seating, as well as other distinctly long-distance features, like luggage racks and umbrella hooks. The new trains were known as the A60 and A62 stock, and were introduced in 1961 and 1963, respectively. These trains didn't please everyone, of course, but they got the job done while offending as few people as possible. Clearly they were a decent enough design, because they lasted nearly 50 years in service. And when their replacements arrived, the S8 stock, a precedent had been set for what a Metropolitan Line train should be. And that is why, long after the reasons ceased to be relevant, Metropolitan Line trains are still different. Well, I hope you enjoyed this snobby tale from the tube. If you did, please do leave a like and subscribe for more if it takes your fancy. I would like to thank my donors on Ko-fi and Patreon and here on YouTube for your generous support. You are the whiskey decanter to my Pullman supper. And I'll see you all again very soon for another Tale from the Tube.